Hello. Um, so I'm uh, Mateus or Matt, if you like it. Um, I'm the founder of a couple of companies and organizations. Uh, most of uh, my business uh, comes from the United States. So uh, when uh, Piotr asked me to share uh, a couple of thoughts of how to enter the US market, because this is apparently something that many founders would love to do. Anyone has plans on entering the US markets anytime soon? Come on. Okay. Anyone want to sell something next year? No? Why are you here? There's beer all over the place. Okay. Who, who is here to improve sales? Okay. Who wants to sell to the United States? Better. All right. So that's why I, I decided that I need to, for once, make a better presentation. So I was thinking about this guy, this is my friend. He apparently has a lot of guides on how to make a good presentation. So he always told me, like, Guleto, for the fuck's sake, get prepared once in your life. So I was like, okay, get prepared, get prepared. What do I do? So I need a story. So I, I sat my ass down, got to the basics, got to the storyboard. And I was like, there's no story for me. This is my story. So, yeah, I'm sorry I did this presentation myself, including this beautiful drawing. And as you can see, uh, if I can point, I cannot point because I'm terrible at that. But this is a question mark in the end. That it's supposed to be. Because I didn't know what the end of the story is. Are we going to fuck up next year? Are we going to be great in the next three months? I, I don't really know because we are in the middle of the story. So, when I found out that I'm talking about uh, after this guy... Uh, and I already knew that there will be no classic hero story that I could brag about. I was thinking, what is that? Because I've learned a shitload from this guy. Hey, hello, you're here. So um, I was thinking, what was the first thing I've learned from him? And I met him at the, uh, at a great event that uh, he used to organize. And he asked every single person on stage, uh, that he invited, and there were great people from all over the world. This was one of the first international sales development conferences I've been to. Uh, still have friends from that time. And he, he asked them to have three takeaways, three things that you can implement instantly in your company tomorrow. And I didn't, didn't see Mick's presentation because he didn't want to share a train with me. Uh, so I didn't know what he's going to talk about, but that would bracket nicely uh, in the end of uh, in the end of my presentation. So Pipeline Summit was this conference, uh, and of course uh, there's a great representation straight from their official website uh, of important guests that were there. So who knows what that is? I know one person who does. What's that? Okay, cool. Uh, so the, the, the difference is this is in scale, okay? So what this is, it's scaling. This is a small car, it is a bigger car, and if you want really nice one and the larger size, he went somewhere, probably for a car. Okay, now, do you know what this is? This is a small spaghetti machine, and this is a big spaghetti machine. And you know what that is? It's scaling. And now, this is a small company structure, and this is a large girl company structure. Do you know what that is? Scaling. All right. There's a shitload of people at the conference, and all the cards that I brought from this conference, do you know what this is? Not scaling. So I was doing a phone call every day, even walking to my job on a Zoom trying to sell. And now I will hire 500 people to do the same. Do you know what that is? Not scaling. So I used Gmail and I would send 100 emails a day. And then I would be listening to great people in, like, like Mick uh, told you about 
that convinced them to send those 10,000 emails from his own name at that time. So we started using all of those tools to send more emails, and that is also not scaling. So what actually scaling is, with, with the scale, also the complexity and the details start to matter more. If you have a tiny car, it doesn't matter how greatly the carpet is carved. If you enter a, 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 a nice car at the show, you, you want those details to be perfect. Uh, so I didn't know that. When I, in 2015, I decided that we will no longer sell to Poland. We will start selling in the United States. So I made a website. Uh, in English, uh, started a blog in English, and uh, yeah, this is how much revenue we lost over a year. Uh, yeah, because uh, because I was basically trying to do all of that because I thought it was scaling and that, that I wanted to scale. Uh, so don't do that. Uh, so my next idea was, let's make a fucking master plan connect all of the dots, seed all of the seeds, build all of the fucking synergies possible, start two, three, four, five new organizations in one year, bind them on together to get more out of the dollar. Uh, you, you can guess the, uh, the, the outcome. It's not as bad as it sounds, but... Uh, somewhere in the middle, we have opened a sales development agency. We've even hired people from big sales automation global tools as uh, consultants and employees. And uh, we've spent $250,000 on it. And uh, this is what we sold in the next year. Okay, I could leave. No. So... What was really the problem? The problem always comes with a magic product market fit that for some reason people, they cl claim too fast. It's like, it's, it's, it's not high school anymore. You cannot tell you've scored if you didn't. The fact that a girl swiped your Tinder, does, it's, it's not scoring. Okay, so I yeah I know it was probably improbable. Im, 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 oh, I shouldn't say that politically correct, but what's the problem is that every founder, it's something that Mick also said. Every founder thinks that at least within a set of problems, we can do everything, and that was my thought a lot of times. We can do. Everything, like big companies, yeah, they will have more users. Small companies, uh, we will onboard them better. Uh, a company that's 5,000 5, times bigger than us as a first customer, let's put all our workforce on one contract because we can do anything. So whenever we, wherever we start, it's good. So... Um, Customers actually want is this. They have a problem where they want to use something. There's context to that. So unless you're really selling Victorinex, you probably should start thinking about the problem that you solve. So, uh, yeah, one of the things that Camille always told me is that you should sometimes put a number in the presentation because it makes it more professional. Uh, so since I was designing it today, it is the number. Uh, this number is how much we've probably spent on designing and developing products that we thought were great for the market uh, over the last uh, six years. Uh, I, I will not dig more into that. Uh, so what actually worked? Why, why, what, what worked for us? Because we have more than 70% of revenue from the United States. We're closing on $5 million revenue annually. So some things have worked. 
And first and foremost, our introductions. And it, it doesn't only matter that you have the introduction. It matters who gives you the introduction. It matters why they give you the introduction. Did they work with you? Did they see you working? Or did they just meet you at the random conference and you gave them your card? It matters who refers you and why. And uh, I will tell a little more about it later, but the first steps are very important. They position you in the market. And uh, if you want to get to the specific place, it's really much easier to be invited. It's not that I've never got on stage uninvited, but it was much more comfortable to, for Piotr to say, hey, this is Matt. Here's a mic instead of getting thrown out by the security again. So introductions is something that helped us. And we actually entered the US market through a tiny partner from Canada that has a tiny open source startup, very specific use cases. There were no other developers in the world that were using it. And it picked up in certain use cases. People started referring each other, introducing us, saying, hey, yeah, these guys from Neoteric did a good job for us. This is why we want to go. And yes, there are places like Clutch. But this is not the way to start. Someone has to actually say, yeah, these guys are great. So how do you get those first guys? What do you do to attract them? Mick said about the aha moment on this beautiful timeline. This is the same thing. This is the aha moment. You want to learn how to sell, go to the marketplace in Marrakesh. They will tell you how to sell. You are going from one stall to another. Every single one has the very same spices. And they are super creative about how to get you interested, how to hook you up for a second. Because they know one thing. If you don't stop, you don't buy. So what I heard in uh, Marrakesh when I was passing by a restaurant being 100% sure I will not go to a restaurant because someone pulls me to the street because that's just not what I do traveling all the world. And that one time I did is, hey, Polska, Magda, Magda Gessler, Masakra. I was like, fuck, I'm going in. I wasn't even hungry. <laughs> so, uh, Give them a taste. And your first sales are not going to be successful. You will sell it, get 10 times too little money for it because you will suddenly find out that working in English is not just about having a certificate in English. It's about actually speaking different culture, different people, having different expectations. I even had this wonderful chart about how Americans and Europeans are talking about stuff when it's good and bad. So basically, long story short, when my team came to me and said, hey, how's the project going? Oh yeah, it's, uh, you know, they said it's pretty good for a start. It was like, what did you fuck up? They're like, what did you, uh, I, they said it was good. Yeah, they're Americans. If it's not awesome, it's fucking terrible. Here is the other way around. Like, so you ask a founder that just made a rocket, and he's like, yeah, so like, we put some things together. Uh, it worked a little, but we have a lot of problems. This is not the way to go either. So being cocky, not great. Being too not cocky, neither. Find your way to that. And then the most important thing, if you promise something, over-deliver. Always. You have one name in that market. And you can change the company, but they know that the companies are the tools. The business is the people. And they will know you by your name. And it doesn't matter that you've changed your startup to the enterprise or enterprise to someone else. If you've been a shithead that promised them something and didn't deliver on the promise, you're out. So if you do that, you need one more very important thing. And it's not awful food. But awful food has 
something to do with luck for me. So luck is something very important in, uh, in sales, especially in finding first customers. Uh, so I was in uh, San Francisco in a hotel in uh, Union Square. I was there for tech crunch. I assumed everyone else is having a badge. And there was this guy next to me when we were putting the scrambled eggs on. And I, because, you know, like the one thing in the US, people talk. Like here, you stand in a queue in a bar. And you, you stand. And you stand there. It's like, oh, hey, you're waiting for a drink? Yeah, what do you do? What are you passionate about? How was your day? And people talk. Not assuming they want to sell you something or invite you somewhere you don't want to go or whatever. They just talk out of curiosity. So we've talked. I asked him if he's for the conference. He said yes. So I was like, hey, great. Let's share a meal. That's also something I would give you as an advice. Don't eat alone, period. Um, so I invited him to this table. I started talking to him about what he's doing. He said something with artificial intelligence, blah, blah, blah. Uh, as it turned out, two weeks later, we've closed a $50,000 deal with this guy because he was in the need of software engineering help within the space that we, uh, that we are good at. And it was luck, pure luck. But luck, faith was ready. If I didn't have all the stuff to back my story up, showing case studies that matter, showing uh, social proof that matters, having the engineering skills that I promised, being able to work under the US culture, I would have not succeeded with that. So yes, luck is important, but it will only be important for you if you're ready for luck. So this is uh, how much uh, uh, revenue uh, comes from the United States for us right now. And uh, the question is, are we scaling? And we're not, because we don't have a product market fit. Because what a product market fit essentially is, is that there is a community where you have a brand, where your brand stands for some values, where your values are appreciated in a context of problems of your customers. So what, mar what marketing is, is going around the party, sorry for the, uh, men-women relationship again, but my friend wrote this book that has the most inspiring and true title when it comes to sales that I've had, haven't read it yet. Sales is a love affair. So a lot of this relates. So marketing would be going around the party and asking, hey, would you like to have a drink with me? Sales would be having a drink and asking girl, would you like to go out with me sometime? Branding is when a, when a 10 times nicer girl comes in, knocks you on the shoulder and says, hey, I've heard you're fun. What are you doing tonight? This is what you need to do, this is where you have product market fit. So we don't, and uh, we got back to the drawing table, and I got back to things that I've learned in this very place at uh, MIT Enterprise Forum from the, from the perspective of MIT's approach on entrepreneurship, is a concept of a beachhead market. If you want to win a war, even if, a, if, a, if an opponent seems indestructible, if you concentrate all your forces on one place, even if it's the hardest to get, this is your only chance to win. 
if you don't have a place on the ground, if you're always from air or from sea, always pushed back, you will never conquer. So that was the D-Day. It was a terrible day for the human history. Lots of people died. But they won the first beach. And guess what? That has changed the course of war. And this is what's ahead of you if you're entering U.S. market. You're not scaling shit. If you were scaling something, you would have had operations there that are growing and you would be in Bali instead of listening to me. At least, I, I mean, I would do that if I were you, if I were me. Um, anyway, if you have the beachhead market, if you have this first place where people know for who you are and what you deliver, where the question, who is the guy from ATS in Poland, is Mick, be it here, be it in Gdansk, be it among fans of Manchester United in southeastern Poland. He has a brand somewhere. People say ATS Mick, they have this in their head. This means that he has product market fit. There is a market that says, make fits. This is it. So we got back to the table and uh, we're finding out our markets. We're researching niches, <coughs> trying to narrow down, peel the onion, as Mick said, going through dozens of our case studies, finding out what's similar to each other, what can we use the, the next time as a story, how can we learn from it, how can we position ourselves towards customers having similar problems from different angles. And product market fit is not the whole of your product, and it's not the whole of the market. It's this unique composition of what someone needs and what you have to offer. And Mick told you exactly that there are two things that move us emotionally. Either, either greed for something, I want more, I want faster, I want to have more fun, I want to have better car or whatever, or we are afraid of something. I will fuck up, I will make bad decision, I, I will not meet my deadlines, etc., etc. Tap on those emotions in the sales process, but focus on, on that intersection of product and market to find out people that want to eat food and use a knife instead of running with Victorinex and convincing people that basically you can use it to unscrew a screw, but, you know, IKEA set with Victorinex, probably not the best thing. And then eating with it, not really the best thing. So actually, why does it even exist? So now, three things to remember. As I learned from Nick, Mick, I didn't know that he moved it up to eight, fortunately, because that, that would be a long story, uh, are completely different from whatever I said before. Not, not that I want to be some kind of... Uh, Paolo Coelho of business, but if you move back to the a bigger picture, um, some things are starting to look alike, and you're starting to dig deeper into why things happen. And, and you move to a distance when you are starting to see that this is not about the wrong script, this is not about the, the, the wrong email list, this is about everything. So three things that if I understood in the very beginning and listened more to me and less to my ideas that would really help me would be first to learn the language and the culture. The US is about the relations. You build relations by sharing some memories together. If you don't have them, you want to have memories about something similar, right? Then you can share, feel together, emotionally build trust. 
that's the thing about the culture. So if you care, if you speak about any topic, and I don't mean if you can speak perfectly, but if you care, if we hold a conversation in English or in Polish, and you're responsible for your startup or your venture to enter the US market, take vacation, go to English school, and stay there as long as you need until you don't care. Because if you cannot communicate comfortably, and it doesn't mean you need perfect English, it doesn't mean you need great accent, it doesn't mean you need perfect wording, it means that you can hold a conversation on any topic. Some people don't, can do it in their, uh, in, in their primary language, it's okay. But if you cannot do it in English, find another job. Second, this is a random guy I met in New York last time and we just had a great time together. So uh, I thought it was a nice picture to put to this thought. Value relationships over dollars. Uh, there is something named unit economics. Right, so you can, if, if you're uh, uh, running a grocery store, you can me measure yourself by how much revenue do you have per square meter, or how much revenue do you have per one kilo of stock so, sold goods, and you will optimize yourself differently based on how do you calculate this unit economics. And I would have made if I wasn't kind of pray, pray and spray doing and, and wasn't investing in every relationship a little too much, I probably wouldn't find, have found it out. But in a lot of cases, the smallest deals bring us the best revenues because we build a strong relation of trust, of a good experience of working together on a problem, of delivering to each other, of working together as one team, and they change the jobs. And then suddenly a guy that was a, a co-founder of a startup that never had any chances, but they really wanted to build it, and he built it for them, and they failed miserably. Suddenly he's a head of engineering at a great, fast-growing startup from another city and he wants 10 or 20 of your engineers to come in because he trusts you. Because you value the person, the way they feel about you, working with you, being with you, more than a dollar. And three, just whatever your time horizon is, just multiply it by three, and then you can thank me later. Uh, I'm at Corletto. I usually help startups and enterprises build competitive advantage, innovating with artificial intelligence and software development. I'm very keen on growing a startup ecosystem. So if you have any questions that could help you move from wherever you are to wherever you feel you should be, and uh, there's a place for my experience in it, peace. Uh, thank you, Matt. Any questions? Any questions? Okay. Michal Korba, no questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, great presentation. Thank you very much. So I'm very interested. Uh, what's the product market fit for Dortaric? And as you scale, how do you train your sales development uh, representatives uh, sell it? Okay, so... Uh, the moment I will find a product market fit as now Tarek, I will tell about it and brag about it everywhere. Uh, right now I know that I can build great digital products and I know how to use artificial intelligence to achieve business goals. And I have no idea who repeatedly needs it much enough to care to know that I can solve those problems. So until I find that out, I don't know what my market is. I'm targeting New York mostly because this is where we have the most business. 
and uh, I'm starting to exploring positioning myself as an industry-focused uh, agency rather than technologically-focused agency. That's a new thing that we're trying for a year. I don't know if it works. This is the question mark on my beautiful drawing. Anyone else? Any questions? I'm going to you. Or maybe not. Uh, hi, Matt. What is your, which, which restaurant in Gdansk is your favorite one? <laughs> Bravo! Um, can I uh, say the name? Of course. So uh, uh, my my favorite place uh, price uh, place is a steakhouse. Um, the guy first uh, imported wagyu beef from Japan, the same brand that is made in Kobe. He started producing uh, the meat, uh, breeding the cows in very beautiful nat nature 2000 place in Kashubia region improving the way he produced meat. And only after a few years of delivering it to the best restaurants, he decided that uh, the meat is perfect, and he opened his own restaurant. The place is called Del Monico Cart Steakhouse. And now he's buying his meat from Lidl. I don't have any, any, any shares in that company. <laughs> I'm just a happy customer. Anyone else? And they have a brand with me. Mick, I'm going to you. Give us a second. Are you really Manchester United fan? You look like a Man City. Unfortunately, yes. No, dude, so you do all of Beckham. <laughs> um, I have a question. Because um, one thing you said before is, like, do you think that people can get over the fear of meeting new people? Like, it's, just, it's scary to go into a restaurant in the US and suddenly start talking. Do you think that it's something that you have to be born with, or can people learn it and get over it? And if so, how? Look, so... Uh, it's, a it's a tough question. I wouldn't expect anything else from you, but... Um, I think much of that can be taught. It's not about being introvert or extrovert. In fact, if you started treating LinkedIn as a as a, a coffee break at the, the conference, that would be the best thing that could ever happen to LinkedIn and people on it. Because this is how networking works. If you're, I'm often one man show in a different place in the world, a conference I don't know anyone at, and I have zero contacts because I just go and explore. So, my path is I walk around and I listen what people are talking about, kind of scrolling the LinkedIn feed. And then I listen to someone talking about uh, artificial intelligence. So I'm listening more. Oh, no, I don't know nothing about it. And, and oh, they, they are talking about AI in sales. Okay, I'm, the, the circle is quite open. I will stand and listen. And then I started commenting something, saying yes, no. And finally... They asked a question. I had something valuable to, to, to add on. So I picked like, oh yeah, this is like the churn problem we solved for this telecom. And we started talking. And this is how you start conversation. And then they say, okay, I, I want to get back to my friends. I want to get back to my friends. But let's get connected. Let's have this Zoom call. He offers you because he sees value in you. Okay? That's brilliant what you just said. I remember when you bought me a kebab in Rzeszów. That's how our love started. So thank you very much. There are no one. free meals. The, yeah, exactly. I love you, mate. Uh, but dude, I found you your iPhone in InfoShare, so we kind of like even. Uh. More or less. <laughs> Anyone else? I have a question. Yes. What was... It's going to be tough. And it's going to comment it afterwards. What was the worst pickup line, like sales pickup line that you've ever made? The worst uh, one. Sales. <laughs> I'm not asking about your private life. I know that you're a happy man. Uh, yeah. I have two questions. I, I don't really know, but probably, you know, all of those 
hundreds of automated messages sent saying, hey, I see you as an industry expert, why don't we connect? It's like, mm, you're cool, I'm sad, let's get in touch. Like, who the fuck cares? So that's probably it. I'm really like, I'm ashamed when I looked at my outbox from years ago. <laughs> It's still better than the, the night that I like received. Nice shoes. Wanna fuck? That's my second question. Uh, I'm not going to ask you for the fuck. I have nice shoes. Ask, I'm, can I have a photo of you on the stage? <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Always. Sorry, guys. It's a, like it's a pleasure. It's a total okay. pleasure. Okay. In the meantime, I'm going to give the microphone for the guy in the last row. <laughs> uh, by the way, if you scan this, this is my LinkedIn page, so you can follow me or connect if you want. <laughs> Hello. Uh, how did you deal with the time difference between here and the US? Uh, so actually that's uh, something I don't have any problem with, uh, on contrary to my wife, uh, because uh, I just start uh, wake up when they start working, which is uh, usually around 2 p.m. Uh, Polish time. So for me it's not a problem. Uh, in general, uh, since we started, uh, since I started a company in 2005, uh, when I was uh, only working with freelancers at that time, but ever since, uh, at uh, at my companies, you could always choose freely where you work from, when you work, uh, what hours, what days, whenever, wherever. Uh, Ten years before the pandemics, and for that. Uh, I don't believe that balance is about eight hours here, eight hours there. I think that the balance is about I can start up with my uh, emails in the morning, then walk my kid to the school, then go for an exercise for a few calls at the office and, uh, you know, blend it more than try to balance it on two other scales. So with that approach, People are just setting up the meetings in overlap times and working individually without those. So for some, it's having a call at 9 p.m., but for some, it's uh, it's not because they just don't want to do that. Okay, so it's just using flexi time. Okay, cool. Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Matt, once again. Thank you.